they were the most unfairly maligned and willfully mispigeonholed band of their generation. Time to start to set that to right. This is the Righteous Bojambo, and it's time to talk about the BGs. Three brothers who started singing in 1958. Musicians and their work carry a lot of backstory. If you boil it down to bones and rend, that's all art is. Backstory brought forward. Bands which are also families tend to carry deeper, bloodier stories. And while the twists and turns of the Gibb brothers never approach the operatic level of abuses, betrayals and black-hearted treachery that the Wilson brothers and their unctuous goblin of a cousin Mike Love put one another through in the Beach Boys, they were a delicate psychodrama in themselves which, unlike the Beach Boys, the music they made always managed to transcend. The BGs and their travails and triumphs were a product of their environment, of the personalities that helped shape theirs and of an unwavering belief in their talents, their songs and the bonds of their brotherhood. But those factors took them down a very rocky and dangerous road before they arrived at the moment the whole world would fall in love with those voices and those songs. This video will cover their journey from the hard scrabble days in Manchester, their peregrinations to the other side of the world and their early struggles in establishing themselves, the music they made, and how those years formed the boys into the men who went on to become one of the mightiest forces in the history of the classic canon. And where better to begin an epic tale than at the beginning, at the very, very beginning. During World War II, Manchester was at the front line of the Blitz. It was against this backdrop of a city in flames that a dance band drummer named Hugh Gibb wooed, won and wed Bolton Lass, Barbara Pass, over the course of three years, marrying her in 1944. Their first child, daughter Leslie, arrived in 1945, and after moving to the Isle of Man, Barry was born in 1946. In 1949, Robin joined the family and, 35 minutes later, his twin Morris. The ill-starred Andy arrived in 1958, by which time the family had long moved back to Manchester as Hugh, seeking to improve his family's lot, sought work. Manchester, ten years after the war, was still a grim and benighted city. Still partially in ruins due to wartime bombing, still with its rows after rows of uncleared slums, where work, especially to support a family of five, was scant and ill-paid, and the family took to skipping gigs every couple of weeks to stay ahead of the bailiffs. The boys ran amuck. Barry and Morris became incorrigible shoplifters while Robin, exhibiting the first signs of the personality that would later crave attention to the point where its denial crippled him emotionally, became a fire set at terrorising the neighbourhood. But the three older boys, when not burning and looting, had taken those first preliminary steps to becoming performers in their own right. Firstly as the Rattlesnakes, then as Wee Johnny Hayes and the Blue Cats. Legend has it that they first sang together live when, at a local cinema come talent show, a record they were due to lip sync to was broken. Regardless, the unique and lifelong blend of voices the boys had took its first a rudimentary flight in the dire slums of Chalton come Hardy, not two miles from Manchester's so-called Theatre of Dreams itself, where the similar youthful exuberance of its footballers was given wing, and, like the Gibb boys, was to largely perish in tragedy, in this case on a snowy airfield in Munich, not twelve months hence. With the debt collectors and the police closing in around them, one sympathetic policeman, perhaps seeking a mutually easy solution to the problem, suggested something called assisted immigration, and suddenly, Australia, brilliant, 
boundless blue-skied Australia that he beckoned to Hugh. From 1945 to 1981, there existed an assisted immigration program to Australia. Initially from Britain and Ireland, and later expanded to a few more nations, which for the sum of £10, citizens of these countries could book a passage on a liner to Australia and a new life. All you needed to be was of good character, under 45, in good health, and, let's not be coy about this, white. <clears throat> So successful was it that by the time the Gibbs arrived on the Fair Sea in September 1958, some three million people had taken advantage. Settling first in Sydney, they made their way north to Queensland's Redcliffe Peninsula within a month. More a cluster of seaside resort villages, Redcliffe had settled into a comfortable, conservative existence after the boom years of World War II, where the ample presence of US servicemen saw money flow freely. Much is made of the Bee Gees' affiliation with Redcliffe, especially by Barry himself, but the truth of it is they simply didn't live here very long. 18, 20 months at best. They returned to their previous peripatetic existence, skipping out on rent bills, jumping from house to house whenever that back rent got too high. The boys were still problematic, causing ruckus in the streets and hardly ever attending school. The only constant in their life seemed to be the unstinting rehearsal from the exacting taskmaster, Hugh. Having begun as performers back in Manchester, Hugh seems to have set upon developing their potential as an act, as a way to supplement the meagre family income. For the older boys, Hugh set a punishing regime. Somewhat of a martinet, Hugh pushed the boys constantly and never praised them in any improvement or accomplishment. Whenever he saw them perform, he would comment, good audience, rather than compliment their performance. This particularly affected Robin, who craved more than anything acceptance, and this lack of praise or affirmation made him impossibly anxious. It also meant that the boys grew up virtually without friends their own age, associating almost exclusively with adults, and in situations where the boys would develop lifelong habits, peccadilloes and proclivities that would cause them great suffering when they first encountered the wider world on their own terms in England in 1967, and particularly in the case of the twins, plagued them the rest of their lives. In saying this, there's nothing explicit to suggest that he was in any way cruel or knowingly abusive in his dealings with the boys. He was no Murray Wilson. Any descriptions I can find of him have him as an essentially kindly man. And for all the ills they did inherit from it, a lack of a work ethic cannot be described as one of them. But the one thing Hugh was right about was that they were good. So good that within a few months of arriving, the boys found their first professional gig, a one that has gone down in local legend. Mounted on the back of a flatbed truck, singing through the public address system, the boys would sing for patrons between races at the Redcliffe Speedway, while the crowd would pelt them with coins. After their set finished, they had to leap off the flatbed and pick up as much of the money as they could before the next race started. Feel good. BG, who was the Speedway's promoter and something of an impresario, was acquainted with one of the top disc jockeys in Brisbane, Bill Gates, BG, and as the brothers Gibb, BG, began to pick up more and more gigs at the Speedway, Webb Hall. I was at Webb Hall in December 2019 attending a rather disappointing record fair. The aged and now decrepit structure smelled intolerably of stale cigarette smoke, mould and faded glory. 4KQ Grand Talent Contest, the renowned theatre at Margate and the notorious Redcliffe Roller Drome and Filmer's Pub on March 15, 1959, a mere six months since they first made landfall in Australia, Good and Gates signed a management contract with Hugh and Barbara, BG, to promote the newly minted BG. That is spelt B G apostrophe S. Within a week, an acetate had been recorded and the BGs were on the radio, Radio 4BH in Brisbane. The songs they recorded were 20 Miles to Blue Land, a jaunty country number. Let Me Love You, a more traditional close harmony piece. Let me love you. I'll never let you go, let me love you, because I need you so, let me love you, 
Nobody else will do. Where the boys can still be heard to sport distinctive Mancunian accents. If anything it broke the Bee Gees, it was television, which arrived in Queensland in August 1959. In 1960 alone, the boys made close to 40 appearances on local TV. They continued to play a punishing schedule of live appearances in and around Brisbane, including some of the roughest venues in town. The art, side shows, which was basically two weeks where any act that ordinarily contravened local vice laws could discreetly set up in the shadow of the agricultural exhibition and have at it. 11-year-old Morris claimed to have lost his virginity to a stripper at one such sideshow, and the National Hotel, where Brisbane's then notoriously corrupt police force consorted with prostitutes, ate steak dinners with local gangsters, took their payoffs and sanctioned, if necessary, who was going to disappear into the river over the next few weeks. By the end of 1960, they were starring in the Brisbane Christmas pantomime, Jack and the Beanstalk. It was at the Rialto Theatre on Hardgrave Road at West End in Brisbane, a lovely Art Deco pile where I saw many a punk rock gig in the mid-80s. 1961 was initially more of the same, until Hugh had the forethought or good luck to book the boys into a gig at the Southport Hotel on Queensland's burgeoning tourist mecca, the Gold Coast. This led to bookings at the Hotel Grand and finally an 18-month residency at the Beachcomber Tiki Village, which sounds like a classy joint. They played Redcliffe, Filmer's Hotel, for the last time on October the 6th, but by the new year, it was Sydney or bust. While the boys' act had been polished to a shimmering gleam, they themselves were far from the finished product. Barry, having left school at 15, and the younger boys were functionally illiterate through sheer lack of attendance at school, and they had minimum social skills due simply to the lack of exposure to any peers since they left Humpty Bong. Apart from the more lucrative bookings, the ultimate goal of heading to Sydney must have been to gain a recording contract. Through the agency of Cole Joy, Australia's premier local rock act whom they'd met on the Gold Coast, and his brother Kevin Jacobson, soon to become one of the country's most successful promoters and managers, they signed for Festival Records. Festival had recently been purchased by future Doctor Who monster and general pox upon humanity Rupert Murdoch, and was looking to expand their catalogue. The Bee Gees weren't exactly what they wanted. Jacobson was told that vocal groups were on their way out. Where have we heard that before? The boys were assigned a spot on Leiden Records and put to work churning out the hits. Which is exactly what did not happen. Here's what actually happened. The first single charted for a very respectable 10 weeks in Sydney from April 12, 1953, rising as high as number 50. The boys appeared on popular TV show Bandstand on April 24th to lip sync to both it and the B-side. It's a very odd choice for a first single, an up-tempo ballad of a Civil War veteran recounting with considerable historical inaccuracy a gory battle in which he personally dispatches at least seven Union soldiers. The B-side is much more what one would expect from a young vocal group for the era, and I suspect that this song and its excellent harmonies may have been what drove the chart before. While Timber missed the chart by miles, this up-tempo Buddy Holly sound like, complete with orchestra, was a huge step up from the previous single. The B-side is fairly par for the course three-part harmony, better suited to the supper club than the teen dance at the A-side. The boys also worked as backup vocalists, most notably and recognisably on Johnny Devlin's huge hit Stomp the Tumbarumba, which was also the first single to feature the boys released outside Australia. Jimmy Hannon's record of Beach Ball was the first record to feature the boys released in the USA. The third single was Peace of Mind, backed with No Say Goodbye in March 1964. It's little wonder this failed to make the charts. Peace of mind is a very poor Beatles knockoff. Don't Say Goodbye is better, especially Barry's vocal. The chart makers, however, remained untroubled by this effort, but the song was included on the Leiden Artists compilation album in June 1964. August 1964 saw the fourth release, the Beatle-like Claustrophobia. Although the melody is still clunky and the harmonies double Barry's lead a little too tightly not to sound like double tracking, the song is a nice step up from the last single and Robin's melodica break is charming. The B-side, Could It Be, is much better, 
a very lively vocal from Barry, more imaginative harmonies. Morris also plays guitar for the first time on a Bee Gees record here. October saw the release of Turn Around, Look at Me, the theme from the travels of Jamie McFeeters, which was credited to Barry Gibb in the Bee Gees. This was never going to solve the hit drought. Despite having one of the most prolific and gifted pop songwriters in the country under contract, Festival saw fit to lumber the boys with these two frankly dreadful pop tunes, replete with strings and choruses which of course were recorded well before the boys were put in the front of microphones and told to sing over them, and the results are by some distance the worst records the Bee Gees has ever made. The record buying public agreed. More cover version tomfoolery with the boys releasing their version of Arthur Alexander's Every Day I Have to Cry in March 1965. Alexander is the only composer to have had songs recorded by the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan and the Bee Gees. The B-side, You Wouldn't Know, is a rocking little bit of fun, with Robin getting his first lead vocal on the middle eight. By this point, it looked like the boys were floundering. The hits just weren't materialising and the live bookings were devolving now down to variety package tours. So impoverished were the Gibbs, now living at Maroubra in Sydney, that the boys worked at a car wash for most of the year to make ends meet. It took one remarkable individual and a leap of faith to get them back on a track and restore their waning pride in themselves. Experienced arranger Bill Shepard became the BG's producer in mid-1965 and immediately took stock of his new charges. His first insistence was that the act perform only their own songs. He also recognised Morris's facility with all manner of instruments and started to use him on sessions. Thirdly, he reorganised the way the boys sang harmonies, making much better use of each of their ranges. The first fruit of this new partnership was Wine and Women, back with Follow the Wind. This was the national hit the act so desperately needed. It made the top 20 in Sydney and ended the Brisbane charts on September 26, spending four weeks and peaked at number 27. It does not appear to have charted in Melbourne. Wine and Women features an odd jerky rhythm, some very ambitious harmonies, solid vocals from both Barry and Robin and a guitar solo from Morris. This is where we arrive at a rock band playing their own songs as an instrumental unit. Even better, B-side Follow the Wind is the best recording they've made to date. A gentle folk ballad featuring Robin very prominently in a lead guitar break from Morris. It's a good record but also a good song and really could have been sold to a pop singer in a much larger market. Next up was the ambitious I Was a Lover, a Leader of Men with And the Children Laughing on the B-side from November 1965. Lover Leader is bigger sounding than Wine and Women and has a nice little fuzz guitar part from Morris, but the melody is stilted and the song is quite dull and repetitive. Not as dull as And the Children Laughing, which is a silly finger pointing protest song in a birdsy vein, resembling no less than the Eve of Destruction, which was at number one during Wine and Women's chart run. The relative success of Wine and as well as the backlog of tracks from flop singles and b-sides, made an album a relatively low-risk proposition for Leiden. In November 1965, they released the imaginatively titled The Bee Gees Sing and Play 14 Barry Gibb Songs, which contained a selection of previously issued singles and b-sides plus three new songs. I Don't Think It's Funny, How Love Was True, and The Hard Rocking To Be Or Not To Be. Original copies of this album are extremely rare and can sell for upwards of $3,000. 1966 was a great year of change for the group. Hugh renegotiated their record contract. Festival, who were short odds to drop the band anyway, effectively let them go to Spin Records, whose boss, Nat Kipner, believed wholeheartedly in the band in exchange for distribution rights to all Spin releases. Kipner encouraged particularly Morris to expand both his instrumental and arranging skills. Bill Shepard had returned to England and would reunite with the boys when they made their way there in 1967. He also gave them virtually free access to a four-track studio and a producer, Ozzy Burr, who was to prove a key mentor. The band effectively stopped being a close harmony act and became a working musical unit at this point. But as always, there were dark undercurrents. The stress of travelling, 
gigging, working a day job, promoting the records and attending not only there but dozens of other artists' recording dates was taking a huge toll on the boys. Barry and Robin had both by this time developed strong dependencies on methadrine. Robin's addiction to speed was to last all his life, and Barry only managed to wean himself off it by becoming more fond of smoking pot. The final lead in single was the thumping rocker I Want Home, backed with Cherry Red, which was out in March of 1966. This single reverted to simply the BGs, B E E G E E S, rather than Barry Gibb and. I Want Home is a wild cuddle, crunching guitars and psychedelic harmony, very influenced by the Who and the Small Faces, and is a complete break from anything they'd ever done before. Cherry Red is, however, very much a throwback to the old vocal trio style. Colin Peterson, later to join the group as a full member, plays drums on these recordings. Good as it was, though, it still struck out with the record-buying public. June 1966 brought Monday's Rain, with its oddly pitched vocals from Robin and Barry, Robin in particular. A curious experiment, and given the great leap forward of the previous single, an unsuccessful one. The one redeeming point of interest is Morris's bass solo, otherwise this was a flop and a deserved one at that. The B-side was All My Life, a bit of a Beatle mashup between She Loves You, Not A Second Time and It Won't Be Long, with Robin sounding disconcertingly like John Lennon. The melody has the typically jerky Barry touch which he perfected on the first UK album and is the most interesting part of the record. A much beloved song with the Australian public and a standard on oldies radio. Our little journey ends with Spicks and Specks, a number four national hit in September 1966. To be honest, it's not much cop as a song, but as an arrangement and as a performance and as an artifact of its period, it's great, and certainly an important marker for the future direction of the band. The B-side, I Am The World, was written by Robin. While not quite as good a recording as the Ace, it has a fantastic melody, and the vocal from Robin is simply stellar. As a final gesture, the success of Specs and Specs prompted Nat Kipner to put out an album, this time consisting largely of new material. The singles Monday's Rain and Specs and Specs were there, plus ten unreleased songs, the highlights of which were How Many Birds, Secondhand People, Robin's folk rocky I Don't Know Why I Bother With Myself, and the decidedly strange Where Are You, which was written by Morrow. But the album was let down by a few weak songs, and the fact the boys weren't about to promote it doomed it to failure, and for all of 40 years, dusty obscurity. The boys weren't about to promote the album because in early November, Hugh had sent an acetate off to NEMS in London, NEMS being the management company owned by Brian Epstein, whose illustrious clientele included the Beatles. While the parcel was in transit, however, Epstein stood down from his role and handed over to an expat Aussie in Robert Stigwood. Stigwood heard the acetate and liked what he heard, but Hugh hadn't left any contact details for Stigwood to follow up. When they told Nat Kipner of their intention to return to England, Kipner took the boys' contract from his drawer and tore it up in front of them. They were free, and they never forgot Nat Kipner's kindness. Fortunately, for the forgetful Hugh, the boys were on their way to Stigwood. Determined to make it in the big league, they departed Sydney on the Fair Star on January the 3rd, 1967, and arrived at Southampton on February 2nd, singing for their suburbs all the way. Unbeknownst to the boys, Barry's publishing company had sent off a copy of the Spicks and Specs album to Polydor, who were intrigued, so when Barry turned up on their doorstep trying to sell some songs, they got in touch with Stigwood because they thought he might be a sympathetic person to manage this naive young countryman of his. By the 24th of February, they passed a live audition for Stigwood and signed for Polydor and Stigwood's production company, RSO. Stigwood gave them a hundred quid each to go down to Carnaby Street and buy some groovy threads, and the boys set to work writing songs for an album release midsummer. The final piece fell into place when Armit Erdogan paid $80,000, the highest amount ever for a band that was yet to cut their first album, to have Atlantic as their US label. As usual, Armit was a canny judge, 
The Bee Gees are still, to this day, the biggest selling act ever on Atlantic Records. They'd come a long way. From privation and poverty, they'd survived a workload that would have made any sane person give up and find something easier and more stable to do for a living. They had survived indifference and failure. They had survived thus far their mounting inner demons. And here they were at the door of all their dreams to come true. They must have thought they were indestructible. They'd learn, painfully and terribly, that they were not. Well, I certainly hope you found that presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. I would value your thoughts and comments and reminiscences on the work and the history of this band. This, of course, is far from the last. We'll hear from the adventures and misadventures of the Brothers Gibb, and I look forward to presenting them at a later date. But until such time as we meet again in good fellowship, or the nasty YouTube police shut this channel down, you keep listening to the good stuff, and you stay righteous. This is the BG Way at Redcliffe on a humid, stormy, rumbly, wet Sunday morning. Come lunchtime, the venue will be packed as hundreds upon hundreds of people stream through it, looking at the pictures and the displays, having selfies taken with the statues, strutting up and down the alleyway every time Staying Alive is played, or just talking with one another about what this music means to them. Opened in 2013 by Barry Gibb, the people of Redcliffe are inordinately proud of this display, so much so that it's one of the few tourist venues on the main strip at Redcliffe which is not covered in gang tags or smell vaguely of stale wee.